This is a geek leader. Hey guys, Sean Ryder back again with episode 70 of A Geek Leader. And just want to remind you guys, it's Breast Cancer Awareness Month, so please head on out to geekleader.com slash breast cancer to donate for the calls. That would be awesome and greatly appreciate it. Um, and today on the show, we've got Patty Hatter. Patty is the C- was a former CIO of Intel Security, um, as well as a CIO and SVP for McAfee. And we all, we've all we all probably seen McAfee software. We've used it. We all know who Intel is. She's an extremely powerful woman. Um, she's received many awards, including the Woman of Influence, Power Executive, and the Bay Area CIO of the Year by Silicon Valley Business Journal. With all that being said, give it up for Patty Hatter. Great. Thanks, John. So uh, with me, I've had a very varied um, set of experiences and career so far, which which for me, I love. I know it's a little uh, unusual for a lot of CIOs, but uh, started out um, two engineering degrees from Carnegie Mellon, went to um, uh, AT&T Bell Labs doing systems engineering. So very much a uh, started out on a technical path. And pretty early in my career at AT and T, that morphed into um, being the, the the technical person out with sales teams, and then that is what really led me into more of my client facing roles. And one of my most fun roles that I've had is very early on in my career, I went to Europe to start up a services unit for. Um, for AT&T when I was in uh, Bell Labs. So um, that was a great learning because b- before I moved to Europe, the sum total of my European experience was a five-day vacation in Germany. Hmm. So to be able to go there with a blank sheet of paper and figure out how do I get in touch with the customers? How do I figure out what they need? How do we build a set of services that A, they want, and B, that we can um, develop profitably and deliver prof- profitably? To have that kind of experience early on was so formative for me. Just learned a, a ton. We could talk about that for a yeah. uh, week. But uh, that was really then my first uh, P&L role in, in um managing that growing, developing, figuring out that services business. So what was supposed to be, um, you know, two years ended up six years in uh, Europe as, as a lot of uh, expat assignments end up uh, extending, but uh, a great, uh, great experience. Learned a lot. I was three years based um, in the Netherlands and then three years based in London Um Came back um, to the U.S. still uh, running uh, services this time for the um, this time for the Americas. So um, able to take the experiences of how did we draw such great connections with our European customers, with our EMEA customers, and moving that to the uh, uh, to our customer base in the Americas, and that was a. Uh, um, four years in, in uh, this market. And then I moved to Cisco doing something, leveraging a lot of those skills, but, but in a bit of a different way. So with, with Cisco, it was taking all those customer transformation experiences that, that I had in, in customers throughout our uh, EMEA region, Europe and, and emerging markets and in the Americas and, pointing that to Cisco's internal um, internal needs to transform because it was in, I moved to Cisco when I was uh, 2004. So the company was just coming out of the uh, sort of doldrums of the uh, early 2000s and ha- having to figure out how do you, how do you make the company run given the new paradigm that it was in instead of the 50% growth that it had um, seen in in most of its uh, early years in the 90s, how did it really pivot to being a profitable company with single-digit growth? Um, And how do you glue the pieces together now that, you know, there were a lot of bumps showing um, 
given the uh, uh, given where the the uh, company was at uh, that point. So it was really an internal transformation. Um, so that was uh, it, again something different, but able to leverage that. Uh, my my uh, experiences from uh, AT and T. I was there for uh, six years doing the internal transformation. Then also a lot of uh, transformational work with our uh, Cisco channel partners, and then that's what led me to McAfee. Um, and and I was at McAfee for about seven years and joined that company when it was uh, still publicly traded in a newly created role, operational role of how to really stitch the company back together. It had gone through really substantial growth, but the growth had come from many, many acquisitions. So multiple acquisitions each year over multiple years. So we um, we ended up with many overlapping product portfolios, overlapping um, processes, systems. It was really just overwhelmingly hard to get anything done. The, our employees were feeling it, our customers were feeling it, our partners were feeling it. So it was another transformational opportunity. So that was a, a great a great run through all that because I went from head of operations to then also took, um, uh, took over as a CIO and we had a very successful transformational run and we can talk more about what the elements of that, but uh, a really fun cycle through through McAfee from publicly traded company to acquired um, uh, independent subsidiary with Intel through the integration into Intel and then back through the uh, spinoff uh, last summer. So that was hmm. a lot of a lot of learnings through that whole life cycle with the company. So when you when you went through something like that. Um, what what is that what is that like you know being in the middle of an acquisition and all this transformation I, mean, I imagine that's a very heightened sense of, of what's going on and, and stress that, that may come with that well it's it's interesting with with uh, acquisition because I had certainly been on the acquiring side of it multiple times from a Cisco perspective um, but never on the being a acquired side and things feel very different depending on the on depending on the corporate structure. So we had um, the acquisition went through in 2011 and until the uh, beginning of 2015, we had been structured as a wholly owned subsidiary. So we ran the company um, very independently. There were joint projects and, and joint research that was uh, getting done, but from a operational go-to-market perspective, things were, were uh, running independently, and we were very dependent on getting through that transformation to really allow the company to move faster for mm-hmm. our employee base as well as uh, and easier to uh, deal with and more holistic solutions for our uh, customers and partners. So e- each stage of that took a uh, different um, a different position. So the, 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 those first few years was very much focused on how to dr- drive a successful transformation in the, the basic capabilities that we were providing from a given I, at that point I had uh, IT and operations that we were really making it easier for everybody to do business, both our internal customers and our external customers. And then in 2015, we had less than a year to do the the full integration of McAfee into Intel. So for for your listeners who have integrated a mid-sized software company into a much, much larger hardware company... <laughs> That's an interesting, um, interesting uh, ride, and to do that with no uh, no in-year funding, but having to find in-year cost savings, we really had to plan very very fast, but very carefully to figure out how do we jettison as much as possible without breaking anything to try to get those uh, in-year cost savings and. 
we knock on wood, we are very fortunate to be able to, to do both, you know, save the money that we needed and also keep the business running and continue to uh, uh, deliver the uh, new capabilities that we had promised and that actually the company had come to expect that our organization was going to uh, going to be able to uh, deliver. But that was a very tight balancing act and the level of the, the tightness, especially on our IT team, the tightness with which our leadership team was able to act, the the clarity that we had on the architecture that we had just worked on building over the past few years, you know, how was everything connected? Where was the data? How could we jettison certain things? Which which parts of the infra- infrastructure, especially the um, the uh, um, hybrid cloud infrastructure that we had built in IT that we were running our, our products off of, what pieces of that do we absolutely have to keep to maintain our uh, product quality and what can we uh, fully integrate in on the uh, Intel side. So a, a lot of what we had just put in place over the past few years and sort of the, the stableness of that architecture both on the business application side and the infrastructure side was fundamental for us in being able to, this this sounds a little crazy, but dismantle the pieces that we needed to dismantle to get the integration done as quickly as we needed to. So when you're going through something like that, what is the, um, what's it like to bring in operations and IT and kind of have them working together? Because I think that's a really big, big, big part that, you know, in companies that I, I've worked with before, operations and IT kind of sometimes pull against each other. It's almost like they tug right. against each other for different directions. Right. How do you get them moving in the same direction? Well, I, th- I think it was fundamental to our success because we really – we had one of the fastest and, and most wide-scale – transformations that I've seen a company been able to go through. And I, I, I think a key piece of the secret sauce was that we had ops and IT together. And it was interesting because when, when I first joined McAfee, I, I just had this newly created ops role where all the operations team from pricing, quoting, ordering, procurement, everything that wasn't sales and the, the product was pulled together into this new group. And so the first uh, year when, or a little less than a year, when I had that operations team, we were able to really sort of build the bridges with the rest of the business functions with sales, marketing, uh, manufacturing, the the rest of the company and figure out, okay, we, we haven't had any sort of joint priorities to do anything big to date. Let's get on this operate. Let's figure out an operating model that works for all of us so we can really make these strategic decisions that we need to make and get on with it. So that whole governance, what are the priorities? Where is the company going to get the biggest bang for the buck relative to all the business functions? We were able to click that together. And that was a key piece that that our operations team led. We're able to click that together in the, the first year I was there. And that, once I took over um, IT then, that was like the best present I could give myself because a lot, of, <laughs> a lot of CIOs really struggle with how do you have the credibility to get to the table and have those kind of conversations with the business leaders. Yeah. And the fact that I had already had a year of trust developed with the rest of the leaders and we had this roadmap. Now the roadmap ended up being so aggressive just for the nature of the situation that we found ourselves in that that first year I had IT, this agreed upon roadmap, all the, the, the senior team had agreed, okay, we have no choice. Here's what we need to do. And here's the sequence with which we need to do it. It was every key business application of every key business process had to be changed out in one calendar year. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't wish it on my worst 
enemy. Yeah, I was getting ready to say, um, you said uh, getting IT was like the best gift. I think for most people that are in operations, that would be like their worst nightmare. <laughs> No, so but that having a great right, attitude. But, um, right, but that IT was able to say, okay, here's here's a, a roadmap that's actually agreed on. Yeah, um, was was fantastic. I think it's awesome um, because be, that's that's one right, of the things that because that's where people tend to struggle. Right, you know, right. How do you prioritize now? That we had to actually get all that done. We had no choice. We had to get it done. We had. You know, an order ordering platform that was creaking each quarter, and there was a half half done new platform. But you know, between operations, IT, and sales, couldn't ever agree on here's how we're going to operate to move move this through. So that had to go first, and the next one was new financials. Then the next was uh, a CRM platform that was sort of in the same situation as the ordering platform. It had been agreed to and worked on, but couldn't ever get over the line of, okay, is what are the customer customizations that sales really needs? Is it stable enough? You know, is everybody tested, is everybody ready? So, but we had to finally start to get value. Then an emergency ERP upgrade, and nobody wants to hear those words in Q3. And then Q4 <laughs> was a new platform for support to use. And that was the first year I had IT. And those were all in their own right burning platforms that had to happen that year. And just from a sequence of when could each of the business functions that played a, a key role in each of those programs, when were they available and you know when was a good time for them to do it, there was one sequence to get through the, the uh, year. So it was a real exercise in trial by fire of transforming an organization because it, it, we had challenges in both the ops and IT organizations that mm -hmm. I was running, but there was so with, with IT, there was so little trust between IT and the rest of the organization that that was job one to fix. Yes. So that we we had a a, a number of things that l luckily worked out uh, worked out well um, to very quickly change the the culture within IT so that we could change the perceptions and the 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 working arrangements and and basically the trust between IT and the rest of the company. So when you when you made that. I guess transition, or are you t you you know were given IT? How did the people in IT take to that? Uh, how, how did you earn their their trust as well, uh, coming from the operations side? Yeah, it was um, it was interesting. You know, when you ask that question, it, I I I'm reminded of our our biggest IT site in the U.S. Um, at the time was in. Uh, Plano, Texas, and I remember the uh, <laughs> the very first all hands when this was first announced. I uh, fly to Texas as I did with with all our large sites, but fly to Texas to pull everybody together to uh, um, to uh, talk through this and start to meet the team. And it was uh, interesting in that um, there was. The, the prior CIO had um, would push certain technologies or certain companies. And, and I remember it was so interesting that there were a lot of questions on how do you how will you manage the team? Will you trust our technical decisions? Um, how can we trust each other? How is the rest of the company going to learn to trust us? But there, there, trust was an issue every which way. Was I going to trust them for their technical capabilities and decision making, or was I going to push down my favorite vendors on them? Um, how was I going to help them build the trust of the rest of the organization? And so we had to, you know, yeah. peel that onion. So I've heard you talk <laughs> at, before at, at every layer. Before about the importance of transparency. Did transparency help with that? Oh my gosh, yes. If if I had a dollar for every time I said the word transparency, <laughs> I would have another Tesla in my garage. Um, 
it it was so <clears throat> I think it's very important uh, for any organization um, for us, given the speed at which we needed to get to a di- different working model within our own team and how we needed to get to a a functional working model with the rest of the company, it was critical, critical for us. And, you know, we had, we had issues. So in that one year to do all those major platforms, it's basically every, every business platform that the company's running off of, we had to turn upside down in one calendar year. Mm. And, we had a bad habit within IT of when when I took over the organization of hiding issues because nobody wanted to be the bearer of bad news. So, you know, just cover it up, <clears throat> excuse me, just cover it up and keep going. And you can't have that when every day is critical on multiple fronts and you you're sitting at the top, you know, at the top of a house of cards on all these different big programs that have to go. And if one doesn't make it, then none of them will because everything behind it will be delayed. So it, it was very important to get very quickly to the point of just to use one example of the, on that transparency that people felt comfortable coming to me with bad news and that they were more likely to be rewarded as opposed to, um, negatively impacted if if they did so and you know i remember it was it was a few weeks of the conversations of and and i'm a big fan of putting out guiding principles for for a team especially when you have to do um do a a big amount of change and i started talking about the the need for transparency very early and the the first time one of um, one of our IT folks had mentioned, actually in a pretty public forum, a big issue that was that we were starting to see. You could feel all the eyes looking of how is she going to handle this? Is she mm-hmm. going to freak out on the person that's bringing the bad news, or is she going to sort of appreciate that that person had the guts to say something when other people knew but were were afraid of you know what my reaction was so you have to you had to really walk the walk of okay i i said i wanted people to bring bad news and you have to demonstrate that so encourage and th- encourage that thank the people that are brave enough to um bring it up sort of highlight how brave that is and that that's exactly the behaviors that you uh uh, that uh, that we've been talking about and really encourage it, but it's um, you know there are some tough days where you're where you're getting some news that's pretty unnerving, but you have to be willing to take the medicine that you've been asking for. Yeah, and and that was key for us. It was key because we just we didn't have a minute to spare. So when you went through a process like this, and and you you know explain the importance of transparency and rewarded folks that brought problems to the forefront instead of covering them up. How did you go about making sure that the governance is in place to, to handle something like this? Well, what, what are the steps to make sure that the governance is set properly? Cause I think that's another important part whenever you're, you're taking over an IT group or, or, and bringing two, two groups together like that. Right, right. So uh, I would say a number of things from a governance operating model perspective, um, we had a, a, a very, um, very good way of bringing all the, all my peer business leaders together every other week for two hours. It, it, there were some periods of time where it felt like a forced march. And when we started this, because that, that was the place where we'd have the leaders of each of the functions come uh, we we're all on the same page and, you know, what's important? Can we agree on the priorities? Once we had the priorities, then we'd have readouts. And there's always in these big programs, there's always something that's coming up where you need 
um, the leaders of one of the organizations involved to get their teams to participate more. You're, you need a decision quickly to be able to uh, move forward. So that that um, continued participation from each of the uh, business leaders in that operating model, in that decision-making process, was super critical for our success. Hmm. So as you guys were going through this, and you, you obviously came out pretty well on the other end, um, achieving your goals and things like that, what was, what was that payoff like? Like, what, what was it like for the employees and for, for you as a leader to, to – you know, what was the satisfaction like to, to finish up this project? Well, I would say because it was it, it was one thing after another. So, <laughs> you know, uh, in that um, in that one year that we're mostly talking about, it was, you know, sort of the immediate change out of all the key um, business applications. After that, we we started to set our sights from an IT point of view more on how to partner differently with uh, with the with the product teams and and engineering because all the infrastructure that those teams were use were using very decentralized so um, very expensive for the company to run it was taking a lot of engineering resources we had every vendor in there because we were not consolidating any spend. And so we took a very architectural approach of how, you know, how can we get on the same page to come up with a, you know, in, in at that time, a hybrid cloud environment that IT could put its workloads on, that the product teams would feel comfortable putting their workloads on and, and moving away from a highly fragmented um data centers everywhere, different data center for each of the uh, product scenario that, you know, many of us had inherited when we first uh, got there. So we, we, we pivoted from, from one area to, ne- to the next, really using the successes that we had and how that broke down some of the, the prior barriers that were there and how the organizations had uh, worked together. So we, you know, we take two seconds to celebrate our success each year and then figure out, okay, where do we point that, you know, newfound credibility to get the next wins for the uh, company. And really the, 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 how much we were able to transform between the business applications all the way through to the infrastructure by the time it got, we got to the point of having to do the um, integration into Intel um, all the all the uh, IT, everybody was so familiar with what we were using, how we were using, you know, how would we take the parts apart now <laughs> and and uh, reconnect into uh, um, Intel's infrastructure and what what did we need to keep separately to be able to um, still hit the 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 price and performance. Um, needs that we had from a, from our own products perspective without that leadership team across the company being so connected on what did we have and why did we have it and what was it giving us? There was, there would be no way to do a full court integration in a year and give cost savings back. Hmm. But that was such a glued together uh, management team at that point that that's, that was the only way something that big and that fast could have been successful. So we were able to, you know, it was, it was a little strange having to dismantle what we just put together, but if we hadn't had those experiences, we wouldn't have been able to, um, do that integration in. Yeah. So going through something like that, what advice would you have to, um, someone who's new to maybe the CIO role or new to an IT director or leader role, that they w- would have coming into to that, that position? From an integration perspective? Yes, or just, yes, yes, from an integration um, perspective of having to integrate uh, systems and things like that. I, yeah, so a lot of people have the lessons of hardware companies versus software companies, and 
you know, depending on which is the, the, the larger company, nobody really wants to hear, you know, how is this the smaller unit different? But it's really important to understand what makes your company successful and what's the cadence of how customers expect the, the speed or the pace of, of your, your company to move. So if you're integrating um, a mid-sized hardware company into a much, hardware, a much larger hardware company, but they're both of the same type of mm-hmm. uh, product, so the, the cadence, the customer expectations, you know, how you're making your financial planning and your financial bets, that whole sort of lifeblood cadence of your company is, is going to be fairly similar. Those, are, those tend to be easier. Integrations are always tricky, but the, 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 the lifeblood of the companies runs at the same pace. For, for us, when you're doing a full integration of a software company where customers ex- are expecting new quarterly releases and um, you know a, f- a five-year plan, you could have a five-year plan, but a five-year plan in software is yeah, is is not worth that much but for a hardware company like Intel the, the, the companies hardware companies they bet the business every few years when they're building a new um, a new fab a new factory so the the level of planning the level of rigor uh, the the time horizon is just very different one's not better than the other it's just the the lifeblood the pace of the necessary uh, steps that the company is going through from a strategic planning point of view, from a uh, uh, rapidity of, of uh, speed of change perspective, is just very different. And and again, you you would it's not one is better than another. It's just the the customer expectations of different types of business are are very different, and that's super important to consider. Um, when you're going through an integration because you can end up with, you know, you can take two very successful but very different companies and put them together. And if you haven't considered how do you keep each successful given if there are different expectations from the market for them, you end up with not as successful an integration afterwards because yeah. you've, you've taken out some of the secret sauce inadvertently. Yeah. So now you're at Barrett Gold, and um, you're on the board board of directors there. What, what, what exactly um, would you say that role is like, and how, how did you get to that position? <laughs> so it's it's interesting. Um, so given my at my last role at uh, at uh, McAfee, I was running services. So. Uh, I had occasion to uh, work with a lot of our customers um, that were at various senior positions uh, within organizations. And just with a lot of the the external speaking, I do speak with um, presidents, CEOs of companies and getting more involved in boards of how do I think about, in in this case, it was cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. And what I had seen quite a bit of was that boards were really struggling with, well, first look at the typical makeup of a board. Boards typically are based on currently seated or, or prior CEOs and CFOs. Yep. And, and that's great. They bring a, a, a wealth of experience. But one thing a lot of um, boards are seeing now is technology is so important for companies almost in every industry. I, I can't think of an industry that it's not, but let's say there's there might be some out there, but in, in most industries, very important. And how companies go through that technology transformation, that digital transformation is still, even though we've been doing this for a while, it's something that companies are still struggling with. Mm -hmm. And then the other side of the coin is, as you're connecting every facet of your company, that's great, but you are actually then also opening up your uh, um, 
your your cybersecurity risks more as well. So you have to balance, be cognizant of the the risks and how to prevent as much as possible as you're going down this this uh, digital transformation path. And I would say, at least my experience, most companies feel that they they're struggling to understand their IT organizations, they're struggling to get IT and the rest of the business on the same page. And in most cases, boards aren't really helping anywhere in this set of questions because there's nobody on the board with this background of how do you really do this? How do you help drive digital transformations? How, you know, what are, what are key aspects of uh, successful transformation. What does it mean on the for the different business leaders, for the product teams, for the IT organization? So I'm seeing that whole question of how to introduce more digital transformation skills onto um, onto boards as a growing topic for many companies, and that that set of conversations was actually um, what. Uh, what uh, got me involved on the Barrick Gold Board because the the chairman is is very keen to figure out how to it's it's all the company's already on a, uh, a journey a several year journey around digital transformation but he's looking at how do we do this better how do we do it faster how do we get the board more involved to help move this along so that was. Um, that was uh, how I ended up on that board. But I think it's a great opportunity for CIOs to, especially CIOs that also have a, a broader set of experiences so you can relate to the other uh, board members well. That's a real opportunity to um, use your skills, use your insights, use your experiences in a different way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I, I think that's uh, one of the changes that a lot of boards need to start making is understanding the importance of technology, cybersecurity in general, and um, and having someone that can at least ask the questions to, to keep you know every, everybody safe and on track with, with what needs to happen within an organization. I think not having that you know, technology-focused um, voice on the board is, is a critical downfall of some, some boards. Right, right. So I, I, de- I completely agree, and I see that as more of a trend, um, more of a trend going forward. So I expect that there'll be more opportunities. But CIOs that are interested in that need to ready themselves as well, because you, you, you can't just see the world from an IT point of view. You really have to have the experiences where you're looking at the company, the opportunity, the whole ecosystem with customers and partners more holistically. Mm. Yeah. So you kind of mentioned like working in different areas and, and having a, a diverse background. How important is it for a CIO or a, um, a, a leader, even in technology or in business, to have that kind of diverse background? I, I think it's important. <laughs> That's why I've, I've, uh, I've uh, um, taken the, the different roles that I had and and as, especially for CIOs because mm-hmm. IT is such a interesting function because it's one of the few horizontals across the company, and it's so important for every part of your IT organization to have a connection with the rest of your the rest of the company how it works what's important for them, what's not working well, what could be done differently because, uh, you know, I'm sure all the IT folks that will listen to your uh, podcast, everybody knows there's never a fully vetted, reconciled list of here are the 10 things that the business needs from IT to do. Mm. Just do these 10 things. It just, Mm. life doesn't (laughs) happen like that. So it's, it's, it's a collaboration to figure out what are the opportunities, what's most important. And what I would tell my, my leaders in IT is 
what we should all be striving to look for is we walk in a conference room that we know has a combination of IT folks and business folks. And when you walk in, you can't tell who's who because everybody's using the same terms. Everybody has is, is very fluent in uh, the vocabulary of the business and how things are working and where the problem spots are. That's what you should be trying to get to because if you can get to that, the technology is the easy part. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And that's one thing I, I feel like I was kind of accidentally blessed with was, was being able to be on different sides of the house when it comes to technology and um, and in business. I, you know, I went to my undergraduate as a business uh, major and got an MBA and then kind of fell into the technology side um, on, the, on the back end and went bounced back and forth between infrastructure and development um, throughout right. my career, which, which kind of gave me a, a more well-rounded um, view of things, which I think I'm, I got really lucky to have that. I, I think it's a super experience, and I know a lot of folks that are growing up through the IT ranks see it as you know, very risky moves, but I, I think that's what puts you on a path to continue to grow your career and have opportunities outside of IT. If you've spent, you know, year over year just in one in one part of the organization, it really, really mm. constricts the opportunities that you have going forward. Yeah, I agree 100%. Um, one thing I wanted to talk about before um, – we, we we got off the interview was to talk about women in technology. I know that's uh, one of the hot topics that I hear people talk about, and we've talked to some other guests in the past about um, you know the, the the disparaging difference between men in technology and women in technology as far as the, the sheer volume and number of people. And one example that I had when I was hiring in um, a help desk manager. Uh, going through resumes, it was a significantly larger number of male resumes than female resumes. And I was wondering what your thoughts are on the industry as a whole or what we can do as, as uh, leaders in the industry to kind of h- help fix this, this issue, this problem. Right. And I, I talked to uh, a lot of uh, groups of uh, female uh, technical women out here in the uh, Valley. And You know, one of the alarming things that we see is women just get, when you look at a lot of the studies, women get frustrated at the, somewhere in the director level and just opt out. Hmm. You know, the view is this isn't working for me. I'm just super frustrated. Um, I'm out. And you think of all the, the technical skills that are, (laughs) <laughs> that are walking away from the table because they're so frustrated. So, you know, for for the, the females out there, what I encourage folks, so I, I feel like I can say this because I'm a female with two, uh, you know, two engineering degrees and I can, I have all these bad tendencies as well that I've had to work myself uh uh, work out of my personality, but you know, a lot of us on the, the, the technical side, technical female side, we get so enamored with, you know, I put it in the category of triple checking our homework as opposed to, you know, out building relationships, connecting the dots will be in our office just, triple checking the report or scrubbing the presentation for the 10th time. And you really get to the law of diminishing returns where the, the, it's so important. It do your work, do very good work, but balance your, your, uh, you know, obsession for a hundred percent accuracy with building those external relationships that you need to to do the bigger programs, projects, transformations. Um, And from those relationships, you're really going to be able to see different opportunities that you wouldn't if you just stayed more more reserved in your office, in your uh, cubicle, that you need to actively motivate yourself to reach out and not stay very... um, not stay to yourself, stay very closed, or just with a, a small um, a, a small group of other 
female technical folks. So Mm -hmm. take the initiative, reach out, meet other folks, grow your diversity of experience, put together, get those experiences so you have a world, a better view of the whole world that your company exists in. You know, if you if you want to go to the next level, you need to sort of bring those insights to your current job every day. You need to bring that bigger perspective because then people will start to see, oh, she's already operating at this other level. You know, look, she has this understanding of our customers or our markets or uh, different things that we need to do inside our company. So don't, you know, I always encourage folks to take a risk have an opinion, develop a point of view, and express yourself. If people disagree, that's fine. That's fine. There's mm-hmm. nothing wrong with a healthy debate. It's just business. Yeah, that's good. If other people agree, don't agree, that's, that's not your, your worry. Have an informed opinion and feel comfortable in speaking it. And then for, for guys... If you're in a meeting, just simple things like this, it's, it's super helpful. And, and uh, you know, in, in a meeting, if you see a female that is trying to make a point across or, but is getting talked over or does, you can tell she's not comfortable in, in um, saying what's on her mind, help give her some space in the meeting to get that idea out. Hmm. And that's something everybody can do. Females should help other females. Females should help other guys that that might be shy and and feel like they they're not comfortable in pushing their idea forward. People just need to be more cognizant of of how to encourage ideas from everybody in meetings where in a lot of we we all live it every day where you have the voices of the loudest folks just keep coming into play and those aren't necessarily the the best ideas that are coming forward yeah no i agree 100 percent. i think one of the things i guess male leaders should probably do is to be empathetic with the fact that you know when <clears throat> there's a difference in, in our backgrounds and our perspectives and the way we saw we've, we've seen things growing up and to understand that sometimes we need to silence the other people in the room and listen <laughs> you know just help help give space to the people that are struggling to give their right. whether it's to a get man their or voices a woman. heard right right yeah exactly i agree 100 percent right. uh, do you have any other uh advice for for new leaders or team leads that are interested in maybe being a cio one day or or moving up in the ranks of, of leadership um the transparency, the you can never over communicate, never, ever mm-hmm. over communicate, um, especially when there's a lot going on in the organization. People want to hear from people want to hear from the leader. They want to hear directly. They want to have an opportunity to ask questions again, especially given if there's a, a, a lot uh, going on and. Just when you think you've you've told your message a thousand times and people must be getting bored hearing you talk about it, <laughs> say it another thousand times mm-hmm. because the the consistency is important, the access is important, the um, willingness to take time to have have those conversations. And again, I've I, I communicate a lot with my teams and. I can say 100% you can never, no matter how much you're doing, you can never over-communicate. Yeah, that's really Especially good advice. Especially when there's stuff, uh, a lot of moving parts in your organization. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's really good advice. I think that's one thing that, that um, I've seen leaders fall short in is, is communication for sure. Oh, completely. And it, it it almost what is that uh, what is that old saying um, culture eats strategy for breakfast <laughs> or something like that it, it is so true it is so true you can have because I've seen it in 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 multiple organizations you can have what appears to be on the slides beautiful strategy but if nobody in across the organization if enough people aren't feeling it aren't believing in it, 
don't see how they play a part in it, it is not worth the paper it's on. Hmm. Well, thank you for coming on the show. I really appreciated it. Um, is there any way that you would like people to reach out to you or contact you? If um... Oh, folks can always contact me on uh, LinkedIn. Yeah. Okay. And on LinkedIn, I use my formal name, Patricia Hatter. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I always go by Patty. But, yeah, people can reach me on LinkedIn. Okay, I'll link that up in the show notes. Um, thank you so much for coming on the show. My pleasure. My pleasure. 